The, um, what I do want to talk about is uh, some critical success factors based on uh, what we've done and what we've learned along the way. And some of that's good and some of it's bad. You know, we've cocked a lot of stuff up and had to go back and fix it. And uh, we've done some stuff really well, which I'll share as well. Uh, I will make it clear that what I'm telling you is my own opinion, not the opinion of my employer, because that way I can say anything and I'll be correct. And uh, Okay, so our mission and approach, this is just to have a quick overview, is clearly to provide facilities and services um, to support the development and growth of sport, leisure and recreation to the local community. Now we use local community as a pretty broad term. Uh, we have, uh, we, or we talk about having a, a regional function but a local focus here. So we've, we've had uh, hockey test matches here. We do a lot of things that um, support the region as opposed to just the locality. And we'll talk about that when it comes to financial sustainability. Um, in terms of our, our approach is around uh, being a leader. So that's around uh, advocacy on behalf of sports clubs when, in, when any issues pop up. It's around enabling our clubs to be better and be more capable. Investing, obviously. Uh, we're taking on funds on behalf of these clubs and uh, investing them in the best way we possibly can. And everything we do, we do through partnership. So right down to our supplier or our preferred supplier agreements, uh, it's literally, how can we help you? How can you help us? If it's a one-way street, we don't, we don't uh, work with them. Uh, and that's been very strong from day one in terms of that partnership agreement. Uh, this place opened in 2011 with seven clubs and we've now got 12 with the 13th uh, turning up hopefully next winter. Those are our key funders. Uh, under the old council, Manukau City Council, ASB Community Trust, NZCT and there were plenty others and I think the total cost was around 14 million. Okay, to put it in perspective with Fraser Park. I mean, one of the key things to understand is that um, sport club partnerships, they don't have to be the scale. In fact, when people walk in here and say, oh, this is great, we want one of these. I'll tell them straight away, this is one of the least financial, um, sustainable ways of doing it. Because the bigger the asset, the more it costs, okay? Simple as that. Uh, and that's something that we've learned along the way and something that we're dealing with. Those are um, the clubs that we've got currently. Uh, in terms of our focus, we focus on our clubs, we're building capability. One of the things that I set up when I came here was that uh, I don't run sport, we don't run sport. The clubs run, run sport, we don't. Uh, so under our structure, we're a charitable trust. Uh, the clubs are their own entities, so they're still incorporated societies for the, for the most part, and uh, they run sport, not us. We run the facility, we do funding, we provide support services, but we don't run sport, okay? So what that means is it gives the clubs the freedom to run the sport they, the way that they want, and if they choose to run their club into the ground, um, they will get very limited sympathy from me, okay? We'll provide support on, on that road, and we've had that with, with one club where we've provided them support, we'll said, hey listen, you guys need to do better than what you're doing. But ultimately, we don't run sport, okay? Not at this stage. So in terms of some critical success factors, um, none of these will probably surprise any of you guys, but it's around some of the detail and behind uh, that might be helpful, or I hope is very helpful for you today. Uh, the first one is not just governance, but great governance. Uh, this is something that uh, the Trust got absolutely right in terms of our structure. It's something that we haven't changed right from the start, and I can't see it changing, or, or our governance structure changing anytime soon. It's something that we got really, really right, okay? Uh, financial sustainability, no uh, surprises there. A community strategy, uh, this is something that we learned on the way. So everyone has a strong community strategy when you're putting together your feasibility plans because you need that to get over the line, particularly with councils and funders. Uh, but what do you do with that once you open the door? So I'm going to talk about that and then obviously talk about some key relationships. Okay, so our governance structure is uh, we have a voluntary trust board. Uh, we, we had nine trustees, it's now down to seven, just because we think that now that we're over the two year hump, um, we can reduce that and operate a little bit more dynamic. So we have seven trustees, five are elected, 
uh, by the clubs and they must be from the foundation member clubs. Okay? Now those people don't have to be part of that club, they just need to be nominated by a club. So for example, uh, someone spoke about it earlier, if they have a lawyer within their, their group or, or somebody that they think can really contribute, they can still nominate that person and people can vote for them. That doesn't, it doesn't need to be somebody from their committee. In fact, our, our particular clubs have really bought into the fact that that trust board is not about representing the clubs at that level. Okay? It's actually about representing the trust and us as a collective at that level, and it's worked well. Uh, we have two independents. We've had four in the past. Those are the two that we've dropped off at this stage, um, and they're co-opted. So basically the other trustees just go and pick and choose them, and we put them on there. Okay? That is scary for professional people having to work to a voluntary board. Okay, so I can tell you that now. If you are looking to attract professional people to your sportsville, uh, you need to understand that having those people report to a voluntary board is really, really scary and risky for them. Okay, it's risky for me to leave the job that I had to come here to work for a voluntary board because I have no uh, control over the capability of those board members. Okay, so where I get over that is having the independence because I can play a large part in, or, or the person having, who's the general manager can have a large part in who those independents are. Okay? So if I turn up, I need some financial help, I'll obviously be recommending that we get some accountants on board. Uh, if we need strategic help, I'll go and find the best people that are doing, doing that and co-op them onto the board. And generally that's where you keep people safe. So it's a good reason to have independence. Um, then, there's, then there's me. And on the side here, this is a really important group. So in terms of uh, clubs wanting representation, this is where we do it. So we have what we call a members group, and that's actually where we have one representative of every single club on that group. Okay? The key to that group is that it's not a decision-making group. Okay? We're very clear about that. All the decision-making gets done up here in terms of strategy. All the operational decisions sit with here, sit here. So myself and my team. This is an advisory board, if you like. Okay? It's chaired independently, which is a great tool because it allows me and my staff to sit as part of the group, to respond as part of the group, and to be held accountable. So people go, oh, well, if, you, if we don't have any decision-making power, um, what's the point? Well, if I turned up at one of these meetings and there's 12 people sitting there and I said, look, we're going to put up your capitation fees by 20% uh, this year, um, I'd say 12 clubs would give me the finger and I just wouldn't be able to do it. It's pretty simple. So as an advisory board, um, they're powerful. It's chaired by an independent and that independent comes to our board meeting at each meeting for the first 20 minutes and they talk about stuff there. Okay? Uh, the members group is where we deal with um, ropes, fields, facilities. Okay? People, the first time I went to one of these, uh, these meetings here, uh, it was a whole hour of the clubs asking for stuff. Oh, we need a trailer, we need new post pads, we need scoreboards. And uh, we weren't in a financial position to do that. So we came through agreement through that, that um, group to say, look, we're not going to cash fund any assets. We're not in a position to cash fund, we still make a cash loss. Uh, we're not going to cash fund any assets whatsoever. But I tell you what, if there's an asset that can be used by multiple clubs, so three or four of the clubs can use a trailer, you know, Cricket will use it for pads, oh sorry, for covers, Rugby will use it for post pads, um, football might use it, then okay, submit it to myself, and then uh, I'll go and get the funding for it. Okay, if it's something that benefits one club, and previously they would have gone and got funding, then my expectation is that you guys still go and get funding for it. Okay? So these scoreboards are relatively new, and uh, it took me two and a half years, but we finally got them. Um, but that was with uh, funding, uh, external funding, so gaming funding, as well as a contribution from uh, hockey and a contribution from rugby. Pretty good way of doing it. Uh, the other good thing about a members group is that the clubs tend to self-regulate. I think um, over time what's happened is, I think Trudy talked about, you know, you have these poor chairpersons having to go into bat for sports for, because that's, they're, they're trying to describe a new world to their members. After three years, the committees actually roll over a little bit, 
And now into year three, year four, this is just how life is. You know, it becomes the norm. Sport, the sport club partnership here, sharing these facilities has become the norm. We don't have those arguments anymore. When they do pop up, the other clubs self-regulate. So for example, if, um, if tennis say, oh, we, we need this and that, the other clubs go, well, hang on. No, no, we've discussed that. You're not, we, we're not having that. Um, so that group is really helpful. It's a really good way to make sure the clubs get a say, provide some strong advice, and have it chaired by an independent. And then obviously we have our staff team. So we run off a FTE of uh, 5.4 staff. Okay? One of those is uh, 40 hours worth of uh, chefing, so take that out and we run it on four and a half full-time full equivalents, okay? which is pretty skinny. The, uh, we have operations manager, so her job is uh, the day-to-day -day running of the facilities, the day-to-day -day, uh, liaising with the clubs. So if a club's got a, a problem, um, for example, the, the soft goals aren't put away properly or the sight screen's left out or the battery in the um, golf cart's flat, they go to her and she sorts it out. Most of the communication to the clubs goes from the operations manager to the clubs. So they've got one point of contact. Okay. Uh, what it also does is it stops people having uh, to wait for a decision. So she's empowered to make most of the operational decisions around the place without having to come to me. So clubs can get almost instant uh, feedback. Uh, we have a bar and kitchen manager, uh, so full-time position. We have an administrator, which is a full-time position. Operation support is effectively the sole charge weekend person who uh, runs around and provides support for the clubs on, on the Saturday and Sundays. And, uh, and then obviously casual bar and kitchen staff. So our total staff is about 12 here, and that includes the majority of casual um, bar and kitchen staff. Uh, one thing that I will harp on about is around the trust board and uh, you know everyone's talked about how important this is in terms of if you're going to have a board. Uh, one thing that we've learned is that the best people to put on that board are not clubbies. So if you know you have that person that does 20-30 hours of voluntary work with the kids every single week for the club, does everything in their own time, sews uniforms, that sort of thing, they're not the right people to put on the trust uh, because they're the right people to still keep doing that 25 hours, sewing uniforms and that sort of thing. So it's about putting people on the right seat on the bus and uh, clubbies don't work up there. Okay, they want to be doing stuff. That trust, I make sure they don't do stuff. Okay, so they do strategy, they tell me what to do, then I go and do it. In terms of uh, our documents, so we just want to talk about some key documents. Uh, one is that we have some governance policies and uh, it was interesting having in, uh, Sport NZ here because some of these documents actually came from, from those uh, documents that they have on their website. So I can tell you that they work. Uh, one is that we have governance policies. So this is a very good or very important document for me, uh, <coughs> reporting to a voluntary board because what it outlines is exactly what their role is what my role is, and literally we can pull it out of the drawer if there's ever um, a dust up and say, hang on, you guys bugger off. Don't tell me how to do that. Here's the outcome you wanted me to do. That's what I'll do. You guys bugger off. Okay? So it makes it really, really clear. It also gives me my limitations. So, uh, um, uh, for example, PR. Uh, the only people that can speak on behalf of the trust is myself and the chair once he's spoken to me. Okay, so it makes that very, very clear. So when John was talking about the, the role of the chairman is not to lead the organisation, that's what he means. Okay, so we can't have trustees turn up to something and talk on behalf of the trust unless they've actually gone through the chair and myself, and even in that case we'll probably say no. Okay, financial sustainability, this is really, really obvious. Um, probably the first place to start with financial sustainability is to have some financial capability. And uh, usually when I, I talk to a lot of people about sport club partnerships and I say, okay, so who are you going to get to run this thing? Oh yeah, I think um, the local board or, or us, we've put, to put aside $45,000 to try and employ someone to run this. $45,000? Well, you're screwed because you won't find someone for $45,000 who has the financial capability to run these things. Okay? 
You'll find a custodian for $45,000, but you will not find a professional person with the financial capability to run these things. Okay? It's all very well having accountants on your trust board, okay, which is what we do, uh, but getting financial capability once a month will not make these survive. You need financial capability every single day. Okay? Literally every single day. Um, and that's very important. So I think up front you need to understand what you're going to have to pay for that. Okay? And understand how you're going to have to uh, fund it. Uh, the, the, one of the first things that people say when they walk in is, oh that's fantastic, we need one of these. Well good luck. And one of, the, one of the things that I'll be very open about is that this is probably one of the least sustainable models uh, to run with, okay? Because literally, the bigger the asset, the more it costs. Uh, you know, people say, oh, old assets are very expensive. Actually, new assets are very expensive. Uh, our HVAC uh, has a warranty for three years, okay? Now, to keep that in warranty, we have to spend four and a half grand a year on having those serviced. Not just checked, serviced, to keep them in warranty. So I would say that next year they're going to be probably about a third of that price because they'll be out of warranty. What are those you're talking about? HVAC, so for example, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. It's a big system in this building, it's a big building. Uh, to keep it in warranty, they want to come and change your filters every three months. Now, you don't change your filters on your heat pump at home every three months. You'd be lucky to do it every two, three years. Okay, but that's what you need to do to keep it in warranty. So the first three years of life for a new building, very expensive. Okay, you need to bear, bear that in mind. I think also that the uh, sport club partnerships don't have to be based on facilities. And Christchurch is a very good example of this at the moment. So I was working in Christchurch at QE2 Park. Uh, that gets smashed over. All of a sudden people have to consider grouping together and doing this. And they didn't have three years to build new stuff. So they're still in, uh, in old buildings, working together, getting similar benefits to what we're doing. So I'm just saying, whilst I'm very appreciative of this big building, it costs a hell of a lot and a facility doesn't have to be the basis for a solid partnership. And Christchurch is a really good example of that. One of the keys is um, planning your income streams. I think during the planning phase, what everyone does is all the clubs turn up and they say, this is what we want and this is, this is what we want to get out of it. What you actually need to do is start looking outward as well. So you need to do that. You need to understand what clubs want, but you also need to look outwards and say, hey guys, by the way, as a collective, how are we going to fund all this ongoing? Okay? And it's a lot easier to do that when you're setting it up as opposed to when you've already opened the doors. Okay, and I'll give you an example. So currently we, uh, other than our administrative offices downstairs, we don't really have any office space. Okay? There's uh, two what were um, storage cupboards, they're about 3 metres by 2.5. Uh, we lease those out at about 10 grand a year. Okay? One is to a physio, and the other one is to New Zealand Institute of Sport. Now, if we had to sit around the table early on and just took a deep breath and thought about what some of our uh, income streams were going to be later on when we opened the doors, we probably would have built eight of them. Okay, purpose-built offices because that's 80 grand. That'll be really helpful right now. Okay, but we didn't. So that's one of the key learnings for, uh, that I'd like to pass on is you need to think about some of these secondary income streams uh, during your planning phase. How are you going to get this income? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Another example, I guess, is these function rooms. So there's, there's one here and there's one on the other side. This was always set up for bar and kitchen, club room, and, and functions as well. Okay. Uh, but during the day, so this this place opens at 5, 5 p.m. on Thursday, Friday, uh, and then Saturday, Sunday, it's open from 12 to 12. Uh, it's a lot of dead time for a big part of the building. Uh, so in terms of a revenue stream, instead of having to do all these little daytime meetings in these, uh, in these rooms, we pulled in a tenant. Okay, so New Zealand Institute of Sport passed a considerable amount of money to lease this as a, um, as a campus, if you like, from 9 till 3 which is a time when we're dead anyway. Okay? I would say that will be no different to any other sports for around the country. Nine till three will be absolutely dead for you. 
So when you're in your planning phase, think about what are you going to do with your facility, how are you going to maximise some of the revenue during that 9 to 3 time when clubs don't use it. Okay. So we have about 60 students a day here, come through and get taught between this room, that room, use the other facilities as well. Okay. And they pay good coin for it. Okay. It has no detrimental effect to any of our clubs, because our clubs start from 3 o'clock. Okay. They don't use it Saturday, Sundays, and they're not even here school holidays. Okay. But it's pumping in about 70k, and then you can take that up to 80k when you, you bring in all the other secondary spends. people. We have a database of 3,000 people, we value that. When we go to a commercial sponsor, we can say, we can put your uh, logo in front of 3,000 people. Okay. But they'll say, well, I don't want my logo in there, I want sales. Right, okay. So this is very difficult. Very, very difficult. Uh, the signs that we have around the hockey turf, they, uh, they go for about a thousand bucks a, a year. Trying to sell one of those is almost as difficult as uh, putting in a funding application and, and spending a day on that and actually getting a, a bigger amount. Okay? So I put no effort into that. Like literally zero. Okay, because it's not worth the time and effort that we have. Sponsorship is a myth, so up front, don't rely on it. If you get sponsorship, that's great. Uh, but don't include it. Uh, my advice would be, don't include it in a business plan up front, because it'll cock you up afterwards. Um, and the last one in terms of uh, financial sustainability is social enterprise. And uh, as we struggle, or as community sports struggles to make ends meet, we need to look at other ways uh, of bringing in income. And uh, other charities have done it very well. So if you take uh, Red Cross or, or Sally's, they'll have, uh, they'll have white elephant stores, right? And they'll be selling uh, basically old people's junk to other people. And they make a lot of money off that. Well, that's a social enterprise. There's a social benefit, so they're not actually paying tax on that. Okay? Uh, we're currently looking at a social enterprise, which would be a gym, okay? a commercial gym, which we can run on under a very cheap model if we don't have to pay rent, and we can minimise uh, the labour cost because we've got uh, the Institute of Sport based here. Okay? So is there some social enterprise functions down the line that could help you out? One thing uh, also in financial sustainability is that we find it very easy to get funding for assets. Uh, in fact, almost no trouble getting funding for assets. It's very, very hard to get OPEX money. You know, people like to give you money and they will want to see you spend it within three months and then they want to see this big tangible thing over there and say, oh, we did, we got that, we helped them out with that. Um, but it's very hard to get a check and they say, yeah, you just spend it and we trust you. Very, very hard to do that, okay? Um, so that's another thing to consider. It's easy to get the assets, it's hard to get OPEX money. Uh, now, I want to share some uh, figures for you because this will put some real life stuff into here. So uh, this is our um, income after subsidy and interest, so it includes uh, our council subsidy and our interest. Our bar and functions is just under 50% of our turnover. Okay, our turnover is about $1.1 million here and uh, costs us about one point two. so you figure that out. Um, but I'm still employed, so it can't be too bad. Uh, sponsorship, as you can see, is a generous 4%. Okay, it's almost next to nothing. A lot of that sponsorship is actually uh, legacy sponsorship from when we opened up. So people uh, giving up when, you know, when, the, when the brochure's glossy. Uh, plane surface hire, so this is hire to the facilities, 15%. Um, Programs and activities, so like I say, we don't run sport. At the moment, we're uh, trying to walk before we can run. So yes, we provide some uh, background services to the clubs, but we don't provide a lot of direct services out to the community, okay? But we need to. We need to understand what services the community values that we can actually put a price on and generate some revenue from. Uh, fees and donations is 17%, so not too bad actually. Uh, and the council subsidy that we get is 14% of our turnover. So our job is effectively uh, to replicate that 14% in amongst these, or a social enterprise or some, uh, some other revenue stream, which is what my job is at the moment. Okay. Um, in terms of our costs, depreciation is a real killer for us. Uh, started off at about uh, 200k when we opened up, and it's now at about one. 183,000, something like that. Um, 
and that's 15% of our cost. Now we don't cash fund that, so you know, but we're cash funding probably 40, 50,000 of that at the moment because sooner or later we're going to have to start replacing the stuff. Um, we also, just like Trudy, we took over a whole bunch of old assets that were uh, worth nothing to us, but obviously worth a million bucks to the club that had them. And um, so we have to obviously uh, fund those. So we're cash funding about 40k a year at the moment for, uh, for some of those assets. Again, a lot of them we can get funding for, okay. Uh, marketing is about 4%. So that's marketing, uh, what we do, particularly the functions in bar. So we need to do that to generate that uh, cash flow of 540k. Uh, cleaning is 5%. Salary wages and employment is about 20%, which is pretty good in the rec, in the rec industry. But again, we're, we're running off about 4.5 FTE, so she's pretty tight. The uh, administration is about 10% and repairs and maintenance is 7%. Any questions on that one? Your R&M costs include, uh, and your depreciation include all the sports fields or not? Not the sports fields. Uh, we have a sharing agreement with council here. So council, just like they do with all the other parks, they maintain the park. We have a relationship with council and the contractor around the standards of that um, and what we can do to man manage the park better. The bowling greens are uh, the same, so council look after those. We, we own the tennis courts, so we maintain those and we share costs on some servers. So for example, on a park council would normally have toilets. We put the public toilets on the end of our facility. So we manage them on a day-to-day -day basis and we share the cost for some of those, including the changing rooms. Okay. So the one depreciation you quote is this building, yep. tennis courts and toilets. Correct, but it's only parts. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, it's a good question actually. Uh, <coughs> the way we did the ownership of this building was, uh, it's about 15% uh, for the trust and the rest is the council. The reason being is one, they put a big whack of uh, capital in, so it makes sense. But also, if we, if we actually took ownership of the building, the depreciation would just blow us off the park. Um, and it'll be very difficult <coughs> going to funders to say that you're going to be sustainable. So that's one of the reasons we did that. So it could actually be a lot higher. In fact, I, I actually think it's uh, not a bad rate of depreciation at the moment in terms of sitting about that 150, I'd like to get it to there because it still allows you that to on paper to make a loss. Uh, so when you're going to funders, um, but you're actually not making a cash loss. Yeah. What, what are the main elements of cost of service? Uh, running the bar. Yeah, our biggest uh, revenue spinner is, is the bar and function rooms. Cost of sales includes the bar, alcohol, food. Um, generally that's it, bit of merchandise. Yeah. Okay. Um, Community strategy, this is a really important one and uh, my background's in community recreation uh, but also in um, some social service stuff and uh, the, the question that I'll constantly ask my staff is what reason uh, does the community have to support us? Everyone's very good at putting together a community strategy when you build these things because council want to see how it's going to affect a whole bunch of people so they can justify their rates. But the reality is you rely on the community for those secondary revenue streams. Okay, so if you open on day one and just look inside your facility and you don't leave and you don't walk down the road and talk to people, uh, you're screwed. Particularly when you're localised like us, if, uh, if we piss off Pam who lives in the house down there, she will tell 100 people by Thursday. <laughs> I assure you of that. Uh, so this is around, so, you know, this is around some relationship stuff. So recently we had a um, Chiefs First Blues development game here. Uh, we had some big generators for some portable lighting to, to boost the lighting on the park because it's not really what we're about. But it's a good, it was a good free community event. Uh, what we did is uh, myself and another staff member walked around to all those houses on the park, knocked on the door, told them what we were doing. If you've got any problems, here's our number. By the way, here's a $10 voucher for the bar. Sorry to inconvenience you. Okay, it's going to be noisy tonight from this time to this time. Uh, wow, what a response you get from that. Okay. Um, probably we, our community strategy, re strategy revolves around our True Sport initiative. So this is us uh, sitting down, or myself and some staff sitting down going, you know, what reason do we have to really give the community something to support us for? Also, we're a charity, so I've got some moral, um, I certainly have some moral uh, burden or felt some moral burden to make sure that we're not just giving to the clubs. 
you know, we, we, that the community as a whole are getting a benefit from what we're doing. Uh, so we put together two sport initiative. We went to all our uh, commercial friends, which are up on that board there, and basically asked them for cash. Okay, it took me about six weeks the first year, and we raised about uh, $17,000 or $16,000. And uh, what we do is we fund kids in financial hardship uh, from anywhere in the area, uh, or yeah, from basically any locality, as long as they join a club, uh, a Papatoi based club. So it doesn't have to be one of our home clubs. That was the key. So if they want to join rugby league, if that isn't one of our home based clubs, they can still apply for funding through here. Okay? It wasn't a cost to our members because we went and got this funded. And uh, the average, what, what we pay is the membership fees as well as any essential gear. So if it's rugby, we'll pay 50 bucks for a kid to join the club. We'll pay 50 bucks for boots or whatever it costs them to get boots. Mouth guard if it's essential. And if the rugby club, usually you have to buy socks, so we'll fund those as well. Okay. Now how they access that money, there is criteria to that, but how they access that money is they go to the, uh, their school or the sports club directly, and then the school or sports club refers them um, through to the two sport. So we don't have to make any call on that, that kid's financial position because someone that knows them is actually referring them. Someone that knows them and we trust um, and is registered to the cause will say, hey, Johnny needs some help. Okay? And this is helping um, making sports accessible to kids that don't normally get there. So uh, if, let's take cricket. I don't mean to offend anyone. It's a reasonably white sport, right? And um, perhaps tell you a lot of Indians, but not many, many PI or Māori kids play cricket or hockey for that matter because it's so expensive. You know, hockey can be three hundred bucks. Um, so all of a sudden, we got two full teams apply for our cricket club. So the cricket club is actually getting the fees, right? Because we're paying the fees for the, the club. They're getting new members. We'll pay for the first two years. So we say, we'll get them into sport. We'll keep them in sport for another year. After that, it's up to the family and the, and the club to keep them in here. And if you can't keep them in there, you probably haven't shown them as a club that you supply good value, okay? Um, so that's something that we do, and we shout about that, and we do, um, we do media releases and the like, so our sponsors continue to support that and it's a really good feel. It's just something that when we market that, it's not the sports centre, it's actually the charitable trust, um, so that that name is out in the community. <coughs> we run community events, uh, so uh, I'll give you an example. We, we run four a year. Uh, last year we got the breakers to come over here. Uh, now we don't even have basketball here, right? So we rang the uh, basketball club on the other side of Papatoe, down in Brewster and said, hey, you want to partner up? We'll get the breakers out here. We're going to do this on the tennis courts. Can you bring your hoops? Um, by the way, you can sign up any kid that turns up. So all of a sudden, we got 80 kids here uh, that wouldn't have come here otherwise because they're basketball and we don't have basketball. They brought 80 parents, obviously, and uh, they did a session with the breakers. The breakers really supported this. They sent out their whole starting lineup. Um, and then we walked them over to the mall and we did a signing session in the mall. So it helped out the mall, helped us out, community loved it. Basketball club knew that, hey, we're not just a closed shop for the clubs that, that live here. Um, available space. So this goes back to uh, revenue streams and uh, what you can subsidise. So uh, we love providing birthday parties, 60s, 70s, um, providing space to the community here and we'll do it at subsidised rates. Okay. Uh, depending on the group. Uh, if you have existing space, have a look at how you can change that space, i.e. do you need to spend 10 grand to put a kitchenette in so that more, more groups can come and use you. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ideas, you don't have to have a new facility to do that. Um, advocacy, so if, uh, if you guys look down the far end of that park there, there's some uh, fencing that goes along the fence there to stop balls going over into the houses. Well, um, in the corner there, it's probably uh, the corner post. Okay, it's in line with the corner post. So whenever the first five's kicking for the corner, ball pop, straight into this family's backyard, and I've had broken windows, tried to deal with council to get this fixed, no one really, no one really wanted to know about it. So as a good neighbour, we went and advocated for them with council to get that sorted, and uh, they put up a fence. So we can help, you can help and use some, leadership, some of your leadership and your connections to help people out. Uh, and we do breakaway holiday programs in partnership with uh, Ministry of Social Development, Counties Manukau Sport. So again, that's a free service for um, at-risk kids. 
during the holidays to come and run sport-based programs here. Okay? Another community benefit, not really our core, uh, core business. Okay, key relationships. Um, obviously your sports clubs are, uh, is a real key one. Uh, for us, it, uh, I don't think it was as difficult as it was for Trudy here, uh, but it was difficult. You know, there is blood. It's inevitable that you're going to spill some blood on the floor when you go through the process of agreeing on what everyone wants and how you're going to do this together. Okay, because the first meeting everyone turns up and it's kind of like, you know, everyone talks a different language and no one understands. But three years in, everyone's on board. And the real key thing for me is that even though we have some really good documents, the culture that we've built is around, um, you know, good faith culture. So at times I'll go to a meeting and I'll say, you know, people want, question, want to question something that we're doing and ask questions, and I won't have the answer. So I just turn around and say, listen, you just need to trust me that, that I'm going to work in your best interests on this one here. Okay? And if I stuff that up, hit me up. But at the moment, I'm not going to lie to you, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, we're going to work together and, and go through it. And now that works really well, probably because we had some runs on the board, which is different at the start. So we've had some good wins, uh, and they, they support you. Um, okay, this is a really, really important one. Uh, the, the Ella was here uh, from the Mount Roscoe Local Board, and it's a shame that there's not more local board representatives here. Because if I could assure you of something, is that the relationship that you have with your local board is absolutely key. Something that's changed significantly under the super city is that the decision making um, for a lot of funding, a lot of uh, some of the planning, now sits with that local board. Whereas previously, a lot of it actually sat with um, council officers. Now, um, the difficulty there is, uh, we're very lucky that the sport and rec team at council are actually all rec, sport and rec people. Now, we are very, very lucky in Auckland that's the case. But unfortunately, you can't guarantee that on a local board. In fact, if you've got a local board that doesn't have anyone that has an interest in sport, that's tough. It's going to be really tough for you. Okay? This is a relationship that you uh, need some nails around as well. Okay? Because uh, one, one of the things is, we, we lo our local board recently changed at the last election, had a complete change from independence to a Labour bloc, okay? which is no problem with that. But all the goodwill that we'd set up over the last three years and the three years before that when the board was the same, we lost overnight. Okay? So we had to have a punch up to get sorted. Okay, and now, and now it's fine. But you do need people on your trust that have some knowledge around local government. Okay? If you don't have it, go and get it. If you take an insular approach around working with the council, you will lose. Okay? You will lose. Because you need that relationship. You need to demonstrate to them the benefits of what you're doing. You need them to go and advocate. The easiest way to explain is at the moment, for groups like us in the community, our local board are our, um, I guess, our foot soldiers. Okay? They're out there advocating for us in our patch. You need to make sure you've got a connection there. Okay? If you don't, you need to go and get advice on how to do that. Uh, the Business Association has been really key for us, again, because it uh, has a lot of influence, but also because we want to be part of the community here. Uh, in Papatoi, this is easily the newest building around. Uh, in fact, we're hoping that, uh, well, you know, we've hoped that this building, this development will encourage other people to put new developments around Papatoi. Excuse me. Uh, a lot of people that use us will be local business owners. Uh, the lady that owns the florist, she's been at that store for 30 years. That is pretty key. She's a pretty key contact for us. Okay, so get involved in some of your groups. Uh, I joined Rotary somewhat selfishly at first, uh, but that changed over time, and I, and I love it now. But we also, uh, through Rotary, we recently got a donation of $60,000. Okay? So get involved. Go and tell people about what you're doing. You need to make sure that you employ managers that don't sit in their building. Okay? Because a lot of the key relationships aren't in your building. Um, RSO and RST probably need, uh, goes without saying. Uh, one of the key ones that Trudy brought up is the communication with the, with the sport organisations. They are really key stakeholders. Because if you can demonstrate a regional uh, benefit, you're going to increase your funding. Okay? If you can 
have some sort of regional function, you will increase your funding. So you need to talk about that. You need to make sure that you're not um, putting in more hockey pitches when they don't need hockey pitches. Okay, you need to work with them because they're again they're good advocates for advocates for what you do. Uh, a group of friends of, so this is friends of Papatoi Sports Centre, and uh, a majority of them are up on there. Like I said, uh, we do everything in partnership, so we we don't do um, supplier agreements. Uh, we do supplier partnerships. Okay, so if we're buying the majority of our food and beverage from Gilmore's, we expect that they help us out when we have uh, charitable functions, and they do. Okay, so Papatoi Sports Ward, majority of that food is provided to us for free. Okay. Those are the kind of partnerships we want. Okay. Um, and that's a real key one, and that's one that you can start being, uh, building up very early on. So you, uh, our friends of uh, some influential people, some down-to-earth grassroots local, local people, doesn't matter, get them on board, and don't be afraid to ask them for help, because a lot of them want to help, they're just waiting for you to tell them how to do it. Uh, ambassadors, this is a key one. Uh, we, we've benefited very, very well from having certain ambassadors, particularly around that local government scene. Okay, so people that are ex-councillors who are advocating for you, but aren't necessarily on your trust or part of one of the clubs, that's very, very key. So understand who could be ambassadors for you. Okay, every meeting you go to, could this person be an ambassador for us? That's not a formal title, it just means that they're going to go and tell 100 people that you're doing great things in the community and you're worth supporting. <coughs> and the other one is sector partners, so uh, basically everyone in this room. Uh, like I said, we need to be selfish about this and we should all have a vested interest in each other being successful. Because like I say, if uh, someone down the back sets one up and it cocks up, and someone over here sets one up and it cocks up, all of a sudden the support for the whole sector will start reducing really, really quickly. Okay, Sport club partnerships will become a trend and it will just fly out the window. So we need to all be successful, share information, help each other out to make sure that these work. Uh, okay, so the real benefit. So uh, one of the things Neil wanted me to talk about was around you know, what are some of the changes or benefits that we've seen over time. The uh, one is the increased capability of the clubs. Uh, we've really seen this in terms of um, and, and of the sector. I think when you set up a sports field, like I said, you can't pay 45k for a clubby to come and run your sports field. You've actually got to go find a professional person and pay them, you know, whatever the scale is for your sports field, but pay them properly. And what that will do is it's going to attract some really professional people into a sector that's really struggled with capability. Um, same with the trust, I think when, when you get together 12 minds at a, at a members group with all, that have all had different experiences, you can't but not increase your capability of each other because they start sharing ideas, talking about stuff. How are you around this? It was, it was crap. What are you doing? Oh, we did this. Oh, we're going to copy that. Those sort of discussions are, are really important in terms of building capability. Um, participation has been an interesting one. So uh, the first 18 months we saw participation go through the roof. Uh, about third, sorry, this two and a half years in, we saw it, saw it take a big dive. Now, one of the reasons, this is anecdotal, but one of the reasons we think that's happened is because uh, some of the larger clubs have sort of put their hands up and gone, oh, the trust are doing that. We won't spend as much on membership recruitment. Uh, we, we won't do all that stuff in the schools because it's the build it, they will come mentality. And we've had a, and we had a quite a significant drop off in that. Uh, you know, 22, 24 month space. So it's something to consider to make sure that your clubs aren't putting their hands up going, well, I don't need to do that anymore. Well, yeah, you do. Whatever you were doing to build your club before, you should still be doing it now, just better. Um, the social hub idea, I was talking to someone earlier, you know, with the social networking and being connected when you're actually not, it's very isolating. Uh, and it's great to have a hub where, uh, you know, our youngest member is four, our oldest is 98. We've got teenagers walking through here having to interact with um, people in their 80s and 90s. All of a sudden they, have to, they understand what's acceptable behaviour and what's not. You know, we've got people that turn up for rugby now wanting to play hockey because they can see it happening. Go, oh, I never tried that. Oh, well actually you're built perfectly for it, you should give it a go. They end up being good. 
I can't afford it. Oh, two sports there. Apply for it. So we get this cross pollination of sports. Um, increased well being of the community. This is really important. You know, this is around um, having mums and dads turn up for a game of football and talk about interest rates or talk about housing or talking about what's happening in the community next week. Don't undersell that value. You know, I, I think we can get isolated and start talking about sport and it's all about sport. Well, I don't think it should be. You know, it's, all, it's actually about getting people connected as well and, and being able to sell to our partners that that's a really important part of what we're doing. And increased return on investment. So, uh, yes, we made a loss last year. That loss equates to about 78 cents per person that came through the, through the facility. Now, uh, when you compare that to the subsidy that pulls a pain, it's not a bad investment. It's not a bad investment. Okay? Uh, so bear that in mind. It's a, uh, council and the community and the ratepayer are going to, if we set these up properly, are going to get a good return on the investment that they've made. Okay, this is my last slide and it really is kind of around what's the, the future, just some philosophical thinking. Um, one is that I think perhaps at times we undersell ourselves in talking about um, sport hubs when really we should be community hubs. And I wonder what difference that would make in terms of funding. So uh, if we've got 3,000 people turning up here a week for sport and half of them, if, if, let's say, um, you know, don't visit a doctor regularly but there was a doctor's practice downstairs, would they see the doctor more? Probably. You know, if we did flu jabs out of here so they didn't have to go to a clinic every year, would, they, would we increase the rate of flu jabs? Probably. So I think there's a real opportunity there for us to have a look at the sector and say, are we underselling ourselves by just calling ourselves uh, sporting hubs? Should we be about community hubs? We've already got alignment with physios and chiropractors and, um, and the like. So should we be expanding that and, and selling ourselves as a sector on a, on a wider or broader spectrum? Um, the future, less funding will be available. This is a, a absolutely given, particularly around the gaming trusts. I've got uh, no doubt in my mind that in uh, five, ten years, the amount of funding that we currently get from gaming trusts will be significantly less. Uh, and that's going to take a big shift, uh, I think, for council and for us as a sector to understand how we're going to deal with that. Because certainly if you take away the gambling funds, where's everyone going to go? Probably to council. And council don't want that. And nor do we really. So we need to have a look at how we can be innovative to make sure that we're future-proofing what we do. Uh, we currently get about 280k worth of funding from um, gaming machines, um, donations and the like. Significant amount of money if we were to lose it. Okay? Or if that halved. So what are some of the innovations or changes that we need to see as a sector to ensure that we can future-proof that? Uh, one of them is a change to the Reserve Management Act. So currently under the Reserve Management Act, it's very difficult to run commercial activity on, on a park. Okay, we need to change that. We need to go and advocate as a sector to say, if this activity is not our core activity, if this activity decreases the cost of the ratepayer and the cost of the council, why shouldn't we be able to do it? If we follow all the other rules and regulations that regulate that activity. Because by and large we already do it. Council runs gyms on, on reserve. Right? We're running a bar here that turns over half a million bucks. Don't tell anyone. But it's the truth, we're already partly doing it. We just need to have a change of thinking and some advocacy to say, look, we're all going to be a lot more sustainable if we have a change of mindset and a change of that Reserve Management Act. Okay? Um, and the last one is thinking about social enterprise is a serious consideration. So this is happening all around the not-for-profit sector at the moment, not just sport, but not-for-profits understanding that there will be a significant decrease in available funding over time. Okay? And when that happens, how are we going to fill that bucket up? And social enterprise is probably something we need to consider. Okay? So again, that's providing an activity that's not a core activity, but does generate a profit to offset some of the losses of providing sport. <coughs> So that's probably some of my last thinking. It is 3 o'clock and I'm dying of thirst, so uh, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has a few. What examples of social enterprise do you have in mind? Um, well, it depends on, on what, makes up your you know, what makes up your sports. For, for us, something that we know or I feel confident would work as a fitness centre. So a commercial fitness centre, if we didn't have to pay the rent, 
okay? And uh, we can provide labour at a relatively cheap cost because we've got an existing partnership with New Zealand Institute of Sport. So I think that if we uh, put a fitness centre somewhere uh, on a bit of land that was um, kindly gifted to us or, or being allowed to, for us to use, uh, we would generate a profit from that. Uh, we looked at a, a bunch of different ones. I mean, it, it could be as simple as having NZ Post keep their post boxes on the corner of your site. Uh, because again, you know, is it easy to check the post box on the corner? Of course it is. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole range of them. You put a lot of shop, you, know, you get 6% for it, you put a lot of uh, booth at the bottom of your. Yeah, try and convince council that one. <laughs> Yeah, to put that figure in perspective, uh, only 4% of that 17% uh, is fees. So we charge a capitation fee to the clubs per person, so I think it's about 10 50 per kid and 30 bucks per adult. Only 4% of our turnover is, uh, is fees. Okay? Now if you flip that, we're subsidising uh, the operational cost to, of the facility itself, 96%. Now, philosophically, there's an argument there to say, oh, maybe they should be paying more. Well, if that's the case, then uh, maybe Sportsville isn't where you want to go because Sportsville is trying to make sure that kids can access sport at a very uh, good value, I guess, so that it's still accessible to as many people as we can. So it's, a, it's something that the, our board grapples with every now and then, but we still come to. Um, Look, I think you know we're happy with that at the moment. It's all that they can afford at the moment. Uh, plus, our focus is on external revenue. Okay, it's not continuing to bludge off your members or trying to extract what you can out of your members. It's not the best philosophy. <laughs> 